Hello, everyone, and welcome to day one of Travel Webcast Week with Baxter Media, your partner in travel. I'm Dan McDonald, webinar manager for Travel Webcast Week. Over the next few days, we'll be exploring the future of travel and tourism in a post-COVID-19 world with, ex ex with experts from across the industry discussing the topics, trends, and issues that matter most to Canadian travel agents and industry professionals right now. Today, the theme is destinations, where, when, and how will international hotspots open for tourism? And today's case study will focus on Israel, the land of creation. Our first segments will feature an expert Q&A with the Honorable Minister Bartlett, followed by an exciting panel discussion, and we'll wrap up with a short case study with Gal Hanna from Israel, the land of creation. Our moderator for today is Baxter Media's executive editor, Bob Mowat. You all know him and love him. But just before we get into things, I'd like to let our viewers know that at the end of each segment, you'll have the chance to ask questions to our panelists. To do so, just type them into the Q&A box found in your Zoom toolbar, and those questions will be answered in due time. If you happen to be watching this event on Facebook Live, feel free to submit your questions to the comments box. And remember, this is a live session, so your patience is appreciated during technical difficulties or any internet connection issues that might arise. Okay, Bob, I'll hand things over to you. We're a long way from nowhere. That's what my father used to say to my sister and I when we asked him about two or three hours into the family's annual road trip in the summer. Where are we, Dad? Well, we're a long way from nowhere, he'd say. At the time, it was just annoying and we went back to poking each other and causing trouble in the back seat. However, lately, maybe I'm nostalgic, maybe I've had too much time on my hands, I've been thinking about that throwaway line and wondering if you're a long way from nowhere, then you must be somewhere. And today we brought together a number of experts in, the desti in destinations from the Caribbean, from Europe, from the USA, and from Asia Pacific to try to figure out exactly where our somewhere is. And to begin with, I'd like to welcome Jamaica's Minister of Tourism, the Honorable Edmund Bartlett. Mr. Minister, welcome. Asking how things are going. You've been open for a little over a week. June 15th, I think, was the date. How's it going? Are people visiting? Are there flights coming in? Thank you, Dan. And, and you're right. We're, we're a long way from nowhere. Um, <laughs> and um, the question really is, where are we? Uh, the world is asking that question. And in tourism, we are among the main questioners in terms of that. But we took a leap of faith um, into finding where we are in nowhere, um, and we've opened. But we opened last um, Monday, and um, we've had a very soft opening, if you would, we, we brought in for the first week about 75 flights and just a little over 6,000 people. Uh, the mix of that, of course, was both Jamaican nationals repatriating as well as tourists. So we had just about 3,000 tourists and another 3,000 or so Jamaicans. So that's what the first week looked like in terms of numbers. But in terms of how the protocols uh, were affected and the entry requirements as we've uh, put forward, uh, we could say that the first week went reasonably well in terms of how uncertainties go. Mm -hmm. And um, we've had our moments of, of, of anxieties. And of course, we've had uh, a minute or two when people were a little unhappy about the, how the process went. But I think we've gotten over that. The timelines for processing became shorter and shorter. And um, the complaints became fewer and fewer. And after eight days, I think we are uh, at a reasonably good place to move forward to the next stage of our opening. Good to hear. Can you talk a little bit about some of the protocols you put in place? Because I know there's a dual purpose these, to these to these protocols: one to keep the hospitality workers safe, and one to keep the visitors safe. I mean, what kind of of, of, of precautions are, are 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 in place? Well, firstly, um, the big emphasis, as you know, 
is on making sure that the workers um, are safe. Um, and we begin on the basis of having them properly trained. Uh, we went through during the period when they were laid off, uh, that is from March 10 to the 14th of June, uh, we had a very, very vigorous and robust online training program. Uh, we trained just a little over 10,000 in that exercise. And then we had another set of training uh, that would be specific to um, understanding what the uh, COVID security infrastructure is all about. What are the PPEs that are required for you to use? How do you use face um, coverings and so on? How do you deal with sanitizing um, the rooms? How do you deal with um, sanitizing uh, the public spaces even? Because you have to deal with that. How do you deal with social distancing? And um, how do you arrange the furnishings in your dining room and in your uh, public entertainment areas to facilitate uh, social distancing um, and so on. So that was a whole routine that we went through uh, with the workers. And um, in that process, we did just a little over 20,000 of those. So overall, we've been able to train directly some 30,000 of the workers, which pretty much cover much of the broader areas of the experiences that we offer to the visitors when they come. The second, of course, now was to have a protocol that deals with entry. And of course, we use technology to some effect there. We established a Jump COVID um, a website that we call it Jump COVID and had two platforms. One was for uh, returning Jamaicans and the other would be for our international visitors. Uh, we established a series of questions primarily geared at finding out the health status of, um, of, of, of passengers coming and also to give information as to what is required of them when they arrive at the airport. Uh, we also included in that the C5 form, which is the immigration forms which you all fill out on the plane ahead of coming in or you fill out when you arrive. All of that is to enable a more seamless uh, flow when you get to the country. And when you arrive, there is a series now of screening, health screening that we would do. And that takes you through to customs where again, your baggages and so on are screened and sanitized. And then we do a testing. And the testing that we do is in relation to uh, some level of profiling. Uh, it begins with countries that are um, in what we call a bubble. So that is countries that have managed COVID effectively and well as good as we have or better. Um, and then there are the countries that are high risk and medium risk. And the high risk are the ones in fact that the CDC and World Health Organization define as being high risk. And the United States, as you know, and Canada and the UK um, are among those that were so designated. So the visitors who come to us from high risk countries would be required to do a PCR test in Jamaica ahead of their um, going to their hotels and so on. So the next step is that we've established a corridor, what we call a COVID Brazilian corridor. And that corridor has only properties um, and entities that have been certified by our tourism development company as being COVID compliant. That is to say they fulfill all the touch points of sanitation, social distancing, they have arranged their furnishing in a particular way. They have health uh, professionals um, on call or available on the property. Uh, they have a nursing station and also that they have designated um, at least one room for any COVID positive case that may emerge. How many so, properties um, are in that corridor, by the way? How uh, many properties? There are, you know, nearly a hundred properties along that corridor. But the more important thing is that that corridor embraces um, the much of the beach um, assets of the country. Uh, it runs from Negril in the west 
all the way along that highway uh, to Port Antonio in the east. Pretty much done, it's about 85 to 90% of all the tourism assets in the country. So um, we are lucky, I think, because by strict geography, you are able to make that definition. You know, the north coast of Jamaica is a narrow strip that is abounded by the sea and the mountains. So the highway divides literally the mountain side from the, the, the seaside. And yeah. it gives us the opportunity to define that area that we could have better control, we could better manage, we could deal with the management of social spread. And we could pretty much keep our visitors in a, a, a secure area and, um, and not have too much to do with the wider communities because we're trying to manage as you know, the um, infection rate. Um, and it's very important that we do that and we do it in a scientific way and also with data. Now, so, are, you, are you comfortable that the protocols you're putting in place are going to make the, uh, the traveler uh, confident enough to, to visit Jamaica going forward? Are you? Well, to begin with, the WTTC has uh, given its a seal of approval to the protocols. Okay. And Jamaica is one of the few countries that have that, um, what they call travel safe seal, which um, an indication that the protocols that we have established are at the level that will be satisfactory um, for the promised visitor experience that is possible now, given the uncertainties that COVID-19 um, is giving to the world, you know. All of us are in this state where we're trying to develop a best practice. We're trying to develop also a best fit line <laughs> that enables us to, to give a good balance between the need for health security and also for the well-being and economic security of the country. Well, I think you coined so, the phrase about uh, a month or so ago about Gen C and this different kind of traveler that we're going to see that's going to be balancing those kind of considerations. Can you talk about Gen C? Of course, because it is out of all of this though that we think that a new demographic is emerging, a new traveler. And, um, and that traveler is going to see perhaps um, emerging of all the, um, the demographics that we've been accustomed to, the, the, the millennials, the uh, baby boomers, the generation X's and Y's and Z's, as the case might be, all now are being driven by one great desire for health security, destination assurance. They are going to be traveling to countries that have indicated a, 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 a management level of this COVID uh, crisis that, um, you know, is acceptable. Now, <clears throat> the need for us to look at what could very well be in time done, something of a COVID resilience index um, that will help visitors to decide which countries have managed better, which countries are at a high level of with, with very low um, um, R not, you know, and where the reinfection rate is very low, where the death rate is very low, where the um, hospitalization levels are very low, where the incidence of, of um, of critically ill individuals are very low and where the recovery rate is very, very high. Um, the, these are some of the touch points and conditions that are going to define what is a COVID resilient destination and will be um, <clears throat> of importance to the new travelers. The new travelers are also going to be interested in um, social issues, um, particularly to deal with um, with social distancing, for example, you know, um, they're going to be keen on finding out how you've been able to manage and prepare um, the, the entertainment arrangements mm -hmm. for, for, for them to enable uh, the highest level of enjoyment with the minimum level of risk. Mm -hmm. um, and and they, they are going to be interested also to, to see how you've been able to manage and arrange for um, transportation and movement uh, from one location to another. So they are going to be keen on seeing to it that the protocols that you have are of the highest level that offers them the best assurance of not just a um, enjoyable and happy moment from 
the consumption of your own uh, cultural assets, but also that health security is a premium. I wanted to ask you too, is, is with this new type of travel and the new things that they'll be looking for, the different things that they're look, looking for, is that gonna change the way that destinations will have to work with tour operators and travel agents in terms of how I, that relationship is so. built? I think so, Dan. I think that um, one of the things that they, the tour operators and the travelers may have to work through is, is the whole business perhaps of, of, of insurance cover perhaps for health purposes. Um, and also to look at what happens if I get uh, a positive while I'm in a destination. Uh, is there a repatriation plan? Is there a way in which I can make sure that my family and myself could be uh, properly cared for and dealt with and returned to, to destinations within um, the, 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 the prescribed period of my holiday. And then there are some destinations that require quarantining. And as you know, 14 days to 21 days is what the global um, health agencies are recommending um, at the time that you should spend to watch, observe, and manage the activity of the virus in your system, uh, and then to do two or three tests thereafter to make sure that you are free from it. So that whole process, I think, is going to uh, uh, call for uh, some level of logistic arrangements. And I think that to operators and travel agents might very well um, be uh, required to become more conversant with how to, to work with um, arrangements that can be put together. Jamaica is doing that, as I, I must say to you. I, I just left a meeting a minute ago where we're looking at a, uh, a global logistic um, company that could enable um, you know, visitors who come to Jamaica to contribute a small amount and um, on that basis would have coverage for testing, for quarantining, uh, and also for repatriation where they test positive and or they have um, acute sicknesses as a result. That would certainly give travelers some comfort and help agents out. Um, I wanted to turn the, the focus a little bit to, uh, to Canada. Um, we still have a 14 day quarantine in place. And as of earlier this week, uh, the prime minister has said that we're going slow with non-essential travel. So it's a non-starter. I'm just wondering how Jamaica is looking at the Canadian market. Um, we've always been a good one for you. And I know one of the areas you talked about, I saw a briefing of yours about a month back, you mentioned the, the idea of air bridges. Can you talk a little bit about Canada and where you think things might be going for this market? Right, I think Canada has shown a greater level of management of the COVID um, pandemic than most other of the source markets that we have. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that um, the opportunity for us to develop a special arrangement with the Canadian government um, not just in the case of Jamaica, but we could look at the Caribbean as a whole, because in the Caribbean, we have about 20 countries that have very strong and active tourism um, arrangements. And we could, we have managed, and I must say this, Dan, that the Caribbean is an example of really good management of COVID. Um, we have had uh, less than 100 deaths in the 20 countries, one, two, we have had recovery rates that, um, you know, in some countries are over 100%, are at 100% now, and many others are in um, very, very high um, double digits. In the case of Jamaica, we're at 78% recovery rate, um, where low number of, 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 of hospitalization in most of the countries, you know, it's single digits that are in the hospital. And... Um, and they all, the overall incident of infection is less than 10,000. So we have a, a fairly, what I call COVID resilient corridor in the Caribbean. So if we could develop with uh, Canada, uh, the air bridge where the Canadian uh, government and CARICOM could work out certain protocols that would make it easier for Canadians uh, to come into our space with minimum of, of, um, of, of testing, 
uh, because we would have been confident with the testing arrangements that are in Canada. So Canadians would come in that bridge and, and have a minimum of, um, of protocols related to them for entry. So the border arrangements between the two countries would have been worked out and rationalized. And I think that that would enable a good flow. And I'm, I believe a number of countries are doing that. Uh, we saw what happened with New Zealand and Australia in terms of that um, travel bridge. We see what also happened with some European countries. We see also what happened with China and um, Hong Kong and Macau and so on and so forth. So we think that that is a possibility now in the early stages while we try to, um, to manage better, all of us, this um, virus and also to create safe passages for, for tourism. Because do, I you think know whether there, sorry, do you know whether there are any discussions uh, about to begin between Jamaica and Canada over an air bridge? Have, have, well, have there... no, I, um, it, it's, it's in contemplation. Um, but what, what, what I was proposing is for it to become a CARICOM arrangement, because I think that um, the market in the Caribbean would be well served overall with that arrangement. It is true that Jamaica could go ahead and do it alone, but I believe that um, it, it would work better because um, of the, the critical mass that 20 countries would present over, of course, Jamaica with just 2 million people. I'm going to move to my last question now because I think the audience will probably have some questions for you. And I was originally going to ask you whether you're optimistic or pessimistic about the future, but I think I'll change it to, is tourism going to be fun anymore? <laughs> I mean, well, you know, tourism will be fun. Um, that's what we're about. You know, it isn't tourism if it, is, if it doesn't have fun. We are supposed to be maximizing happiness, yes? We, we are supposed to be providing people with the best opportunity to, to consume the wonderful cultural values that we, we have. Uh, and to glory in our diversity and to, to, to embrace the similarities. That, that's what we do. We, we, we are an industry <clears throat> that connects and connects people and cultures. Um, now, the problems that we've had over time have in cha challenged that variability. If you recall, SARS challenged that ability, if you remember. 9-11 challenged that ability, if you remember. Uh, economic depressions and, and, and recessions and so on have challenged that ability. This global pandemic is perhaps the biggest challenge that it has ever had. But tourism is resilient. And that resilience is going to enable us to manage through this process to, and to recover and build and, and, and move to new heights. So I'm very optimistic about the future. And I, I, I can say for sure, that because people travel to fulfill their passions and the passion points are in every country, we will find ways to make sure that you can realize your best dream and your greatest passions. That's what people do. And that's what tourism enables. I think we're ready for questions, are we not, Dan? That's right, yeah. So um, please submit any questions that you guys might have to the Q&A box. And uh, Bob, those should be visible to you in the uh, Q&A box in your Zoom toolbar. Yep. And if any get submitted elsewhere, I will keep an eye on those. But thank you so much, Bob, and thank you, Minister Bartlett. Now, two questions have been, have been submitted to the Q&A box. Uh, Bob, can you see those there? Uh, yeah. First question from Suzanne Marcus. Do you think staying at a beaches or sandals resort in Jamaica will be better than staying in another all-inclusive or non-all-inclusive resort? You asking me? No, I'm question. not. Suzanne is. Suzanne, Suzanne asking me a question as a minister of tourism for Jamaica, covering mm -hmm. all the brands. You know, I'm sure you is a wonderful brand. It's a world-class brand. I know that staying at Sandals, you're going to be very happy and you're going to be well taken care of. Uh, the protocols there are of the highest standard, um, but the protocols across Jamaica is equally of a good standard. However, I would say to you, having said what I said, come on down and have fun. 
Um, Sandy Willett is asking, have there been any cases of people testing positive on arrival? Yes, there have been um, so far in single digits, but they have. And, um, and we've been um, able to effect the protocol in terms of, um, you know, uh, isolation um, at the hotels that they are at the moment. Um, but I'm working now on having a designated tourist um, facility on the beach so that if you are tested positive, you could then go to that facility, you'll be cared for and you would have access to the beach and, you know, be able to move around because you wouldn't be moving with people other than uh, others who have been tested positive as well. So the um, infection uh, spread would be minimized or reduced to, to, to pretty much zero. But you would be taken care of and, um, and we would see to it that um, you, you enjoy the, your vacation as much as is possible. And if you um, uh, want to be, to be uh, repatriated um, and you have the means by which you can do so, by all means, yes. Uh, certainly we know that the airlines in general are less anxious to repatriate positive cases, but certainly private arrangements can be made to fly you out, you know, if you so desire. Uh, but the CDC and the World Health require us to have you for 14 days, um, you know, and to, to do tests in the meantime to make sure that at least two tests are done. And if you have uh, no signs of the virus after those two tests, then of course you're free to go in the normal way. So, um, but that is not peculiar to Jamaica, as you know, that's the global protocol everywhere. Somebody asking how long before travel volume gets back to at least 50% of what it was pre-COVID? Wow, my, um, my estimation here is that um, most of the world is opening up between now and September. Okay. Um, I would say that during that time, we should see you know 10 to 20% uh, of tourism re-emerging. Re uh, I would say 2021 20, to 22, um, you, you'd, you'd be about 50% globally into by 22. 2022. Yeah. yeah. Um, Richard Raston's asking, how will resorts change food options like buffet to ensure COVID compliance? Well, that's uh, part of the protocol. Um, what they try to do is to enable social distancing I think um, if you do have a buffet line, uh, you would have this um, service to every six or so feet. You you know you would be able to have um, yours, and you would serve yourself by and large as you move along, um, and you perhaps would have a limited number of servers along along the buffet line. Um, but in most instances, uh, the restaurants are being um, structured for serving rather than for self-serving. Uh, so you will have servers coming to you and um, the tables are also being arranged for no more than three persons when you normally would have four. And where you have larger groups, um, it's also structured in a way to minimize the, the crowd effect, um, maintaining, of course, the physical distancing protocol. Um, somebody's wondering whether Jamaica is restricting entry to people from countries uh, or where, to the country based on where the travel's coming from. For example, if the country didn't manage COVID well, um, you know, there be, could be concerns from travelers not, of not going to Jamaica. Well, um, we, we, we are saying if you didn't manage well, you have to be tested on arrival okay. on a mandatory basis. So you're not saying you can't come, you just have We're not to. saying you can't come. We're saying you have to be tested because if you test and you're negative, then wonderful, go and enjoy yourself, you know. <laughs> Any more questions out there? Dan, anything on Facebook? Uh, it looks like that's it for now. Uh, let me double check here. 
Yeah, that's right. That's it for the questions for now. But thank you so much, Minister Bartlett. Thank you, thank Dan. You day to join God us. bless. And i um, looking forward to having our Canadian family return in droves in, in, in short order. Oh, absolutely. We're, we're looking managing, forward to it as well. We all keep managing this risk and, and let's do well at it. Follow the protocols and um, with science and uh, innovation, we may yet find a vaccine. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll stay positive and we'll uh, we'll wait for that day. But we really appreciate you being here virtually with us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Stay Bob. well. Stay Bless. safe. Okay. But don't stay home anymore. Well, well. Now, I'll now take half. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to get to Canada too. Take care, man. I'll be some home. of this heat and and um, Sahara dust that we get in nowadays. <laughs> I'll be looking for you. You're welcome anytime. Bless you and, and my biggest love and hugs for their Mrs. Baxter. She is such a wonderful. Pass the message on. Yeah, take take care, sir. Thank you. Take care. We'll now take half a minute to prepare for segment two. As we prepare for the panel discussion for today, Bob will, Bob will be moderating this segment as well. So if our audience would like to take a moment to grab a drink of water, feel free to do so now. Hello, Susan Webb. Hello, Michael. Hello, Dana. Just make sure you guys all have your sound activated. Hi, Dad. Hi, Michael. Wonderful. I'm okay, Bob. I'm Bob. Hi there. Bob, we're ready when you are. Oh. Well, I don't even have a pithy introduction. Um, I'm with Michael Lim, Director of Canada, South and Central America for Hong Kong Tourist Board. And I believe you're going to talk a little bit about Asia now, or you're going to fill in that spot, hopefully, Michael. Um, Dana Welch, Manager Canada for Tourism Ireland. And are you the chair or the co-chair of ETC? Uh, I'm the chair. Thanks, Bob. Okay, good. You're the chair. And Susan Webb, President of Discover America Canada, and also President of V, with a small O, X, International Box. Welcome all. Um, I guess I want to start off by asking maybe each one of you to kind of paint me a picture of what's going on in your destination, in your region of the world. I mean, where are things right now opened, opening somewhere betwixt and between and sort of give the audience and sort of idea of what's going on. And Michael, do you want to start? Sure. I think you mentioned Asia now. Of course, I will include Asia now. But first, I think I would like to start with, of course, Hong Kong. Um, we have orchestrated a three-stage roadmap, resilience, recovery, and relaunch. Um, well, Hong Kong is basically still closed um, for international arrivals until September 18th. We actually have rolled out our first phase of recovery last week in Hong Kong by launching Holiday at Home. Of course, the aim here is having locals rekindle their love for their own city, for them to become tourists. Um, and we, we discovered the beauty and a new perspective by playing a tourist. Um, included is a dedicated website, uh, holidayhk.com, with 10,000 offers from hotel stays to attractions, to F&B outlets, even to our theme parks, which both theme parks, Disney, Hong Kong, and Ocean Park are already opened. And this will actually lead to uh, the stage two of the recovery plan where these offers will become available to international tourists at a later stage. That's a nutshell for Hong Kong. Moving on, I guess uh, Bob asked me to also look at Asia, so I'll do that in a nutshell too. Uh, we're staying uh, in good, close touch with our neighboring uh, Asian destinations, uh, boards in, in North America, as they're actually very important partners of, of HKTB. Of course, each destination is, um, I would say, at a different stage of recovery, but we're coming back to Canada with Asia now, meaning we're gonna be collaborating as a group there's six of us now with intent to be working together to bring travel agents this fall, the first ever web broadcast gamification experience. So travel agents, stay tuned. We also have individual multi-destination programs arranged and, and planned for this winter with destinations such as Taiwan, Thailand, um, and Vietnam. So I'll pass it maybe to the, to the ladies. Dana, why don't you take over? 
Sure, thanks, Bob. Um, so from a European Commission standpoint, um, as many of you have seen, there is a recommendation for a partial kind of and gradual lifting of travel restrictions. Um, so that's between the countries starting as of July 1st. Um, and that's really based on a common and coordinated approach between um, the countries. So we are starting to see some, some movement there and opening up. Um, from an Ireland standpoint specifically, um, we originally had a five phase um, plan, but that's actually, um, please to share, it's been accelerated down to four uh, because things are, are moving at a, at a good pace and um, has been going well. So as of June 29th, um, attractions, hotels and restaurants will start uh, to reopen again um, across the island. And we have developed a tourism recovery task force um, who's been really uh, active in working together with the government to open things in a timely manner, but uh, with using that safe and cautious approach. So I think across Europe, you know, we're starting to see an opening um, and similarly um, in Ireland, starting to, to see things open up. Yeah. Sue, how is it going in the U.S. and some of the destinations that Box represents? Well, unfortunately, the U.S. is still having its uh, concerns managing the virus. Some of the states are doing much better than others. Um, currently, 29 U.S. states are reporting increased cases, which is a bit of a concern. And I think why we are keeping our borders closed until at least June, uh, July 21st. And um, indications are that will probably be extended. And I think that's more to protect Canadians, uh, making sure that uh, as we start to open up more, we're able to control any of the visitors coming into Canada. Um, but then some of the states are doing really well. Massachusetts now has the uh, lowest number of new cases in the U.S. Uh, that whole New England um, area is starting to come back. Um, and then, of course, we know Florida's had a, an increase in um, 100,000 cases now. But what's concerning is that the age of the new cases are in their 20s and 30s. So that whole opening up a little early in some of the states is causing some issues. Um, the not social distancing, parties on the beach. So we're seeing a lot of the governors and a lot of the states re-looking at some of the things that they did with reopening. But then other states like Hawaii, of course, they've had to do the unthinkable and say, please don't come and visit us. We're not ready. Um, they are the most remote place in the world and they're trying to contain, of course, um, all of the, the health issues. So they're being very, um, very strict. Everyone that comes in, if you're not from the islands, has to quarantine for 14 days. Um, they have quarantined police. They've arrested people. They send honeymooners home because they're on the beach instead of in the hotel for two weeks. So it's something that um, the Hawaii Tourism Authority never thought they would be doing daily calls on visitors to assure they're quarantining. But so the, the U.S. is not ready yet for us, but um, some states are doing a really um, better job at, at containing things. Um, but being very, um, all of the U.S. is looking at uh, Mexico and Canada as the first markets to come back. Um, all of the marketing that's looking at being planned down the road is that, uh, of course, Canada being first because we can control our environment if we want to drive. Um, we can we can drive in our own cars or our road trips, uh, RVing, that type of thing. Um, and of course, so many people have homes um, in Florida, in Arizona, in Hawaii. So we think that um, Canadians will be the first market back other than their own domestic market. So uh, we're hopeful that it's going to get um, better soon, but it's not there yet. Fingers crossed. Um, you know, I see a lot of surveys um, and... You know, some of it, it's telling you what you want to hear, and you got to dig around to find the ones that tell you what you need to hear. And I'm just wondering, you know, if any of you have some internal survey, surveying or intelligent that sort of gives, um, you know, a sharper picture of what exactly consumers are going to be willing to do. Um, maybe, Dana, can we start with you? Sure, absolutely, yeah. So one of the three pillars um, of the European Travel Commission is research. So it's research, marketing, and advocacy. Um, and within the research, they, they publish a trends and prospects report quarterly. Um, so actually tomorrow they're having a webinar to share kind of their, their recent results. Um, but I think to your point about there's lots of, there's lots of surveys and lots of things out there. Um, so it's important to, to take some of it, you know, with a grain of salt and looking at it really closely because there's a lot out there. And from a Tourism Ireland perspective, um, we are conducting a comprehensive global research program that's underway. 
And so we're taking the pulse of consumers uh, once a month because in a good way, in that sense that things are changing often and what consumers felt you know, a couple of weeks ago or three weeks ago might be quite different now. So we are taking that pulse monthly. And from there, we're looking to, to get insights out in terms of who might be the first movers back and what those um, motivators and passion points are because we do see that, that changing. We think, you know, visiting friends and relatives, you know, will be one of those first to come back. But I think also just, you know, regular communication for us. And I think, you know, now more than ever, communication with our carrier and two operator partners and agents and, and getting insights from, from your, yourself, Bob, in terms of, you know, media partners is really key to share that communication and the insights um, together to make sure that we're making those informed decisions based, based on data as well. Well, I hate making it up, but, you know. Yeah, <laughs> well, that, that's interesting too, right? Well, you know, fake news is okay. very. You'd have a very educated guest, so I think what you made up would be pretty good, Bob. <laughs> well, Michael, what about you? Surely you must have some good good information. I wish I had the crystal ball, Bob. I, I wish you did. <laughs> well, I wouldn't be if I did. I would have gone for the the max or the lottery. But uh, yeah, I think uh, the same as that. We have you know a lot of external you know research that we can get our hands on, but there's a lot out there too to comprehend between internally uh, with our strategic planning department in Hong Kong and the and the local market data we get from the, from the Congress of Canada, our, our agency, uh, for our trade partners. I think we all put that into perspective on how we move ahead as, as, as we finalize our plan. And internally, we've also, you know, carefully monitored um, how actually Canadians have visit discoverhongkong.com, uh, the Canadian site in the last six months, how the search has been changing a bit mm -hmm. from the traditional looking at the site to what they're looking at for Hong Kong as a destination today. And what we see is actually more, of course, outdoor wellness interest. So that has popped up in the top 10 category. Sue, I know Brand USA is doing some research and is just about to release some. You must have loads of stuff to wade through. Well, Brand USA um, is actually today, this afternoon, they have an update by their uh, VP of research about their latest, so I'm a, a couple of hours early um, giving some information. but. They're doing, again, very consistent surveying um, for different markets about the intent to travel. What we're seeing is definitely the first um, phase back will be visiting friends and relatives, road trips. As um, was mentioned, open spaces is very much uh, the national parks. They're doing a lot of marketing now on the national parks because of the wide open spaces, that type of uh, travel intent. Um, but other destinations as well, um, Visit Florida does their research of Canadian intent and seeing it um, this month in June go up in um, wanting to travel sooner than it was last month. The same with uh, Texas and um, other states that are doing their own research. So I think we're seeing um, there's definitely an upturn in the Canadians wanting to travel. Um, definitely road trips or, or closer to home domestic <coughs> first and then um, we think once transporter is safe and is open we think that will be next and then international travel um, we're seeing the intent to go up uh, tourism australia just shared results and it's gone up um, from may to um, may to june when they did their survey that canadians would be willing to travel internationally within the next six months, which has gone up significantly than it was last month. So um, we all know Canadians are resilient. They were the first to go travel after SARS. Um, we, we will travel again. And as long as the destinations, and we're finding that any of the research that we get is the consumer wants to go back somewhere where one, they're welcomed. Um, of course, we know insurance is an issue and that they will be um, looked after for any health and safety uh, situation. So health and uh, wellness, of, as, as Tim said, is really important as well. But there's lots of research, IATA, conference board. Um, but one of the things we're finding to be very important for our destinations that we represent around the world is we're actually having really um, great meetings with our airline partners and our tour operator partners to make sure that they have the protocols in place that the airports will, will demand if we come back into market and how they're going to be managing their, uh, their travelers. Um, and also, and, and Dana, with this new, um, with Europe, the ETC and uh, the US Tour Operator Association um, and Cato, Canadian Tour Association, 
sector operators working on protocols, we think is really important that all, all of us are sort of getting the same protocols that our, our tour operator partners can use, which will make our consumers feel safer when they're back to traveling uh, sooner than later. Um, it, it sort of leads into talking about, I know the minister mentioned it a bit, but the whole role of a destination's relationship with the distribution network. Um, you know, specifically, if you look at the agency business, that relationship may have to change a, a little bit because of the kinds of additional levels of expertise, I suppose, is there. And I'm just wondering how you see that relationship going. Maybe, Michael, you want to start on this one? Well, I think it's, it's you know, it's about uh, creating the, I guess, post-COVID products um, and try to ensure that our, our trade partners are aware of what Hong Kong's offerings are. Um, in, in these um, consumer segments that, that, that Canadians are interested in and being able to provide these products and of course continue with that social practicing in mind uh, mm -hmm. with the FITs um, and you know the smaller group traffic you know less than whatever the social distancing allows. Dana, what do you think? Yeah I think the yeah, with the role of the distribution network, I mean, I think it's, um, and Sue touched on this, you know, when we talk about the tour care guidelines and seeing, you know, Cato, USTOA and ESTOA, European Tour Operator Association coming together and creating that tour care and standardized guidelines, I think that really helps to instill consumer confidence. So I think it's working together to make sure that, you know, what's happening in one airport, one coach, one hotel is similar for the consumer because then it still looks confidence, um, I think. And also I think, you know, for them to be able to, to see other people doing that um, and having people out and, and experiencing that. I think also, you know, in, in our role in working with the distribution agency, I think it's an opportunity to, for that kind of creative collaboration and, and working together um, across that. So the messaging we we're putting up before, you know, maybe may different, might be focusing on those passion points like, like wellness or luxury or golf and working together. But I think in the meantime, you know, we've been working in creative ways together to inspire folks. I know one of our team members last week was making an Irish coffee live demo from her home with one of the travel agents um, and her consumer database. So I think it's about being fun and creative and getting that message out with the right tone. Um, so working really closely together. I think now more than ever, and we've seen great experiences over the last while of people working together to, to still inspire travel with the right tone at, at the right time. Sue, how do you see things playing out there? Yeah, absolutely. I agree with um, uh, what the other two panelists have just mentioned is, is the travel agents, and I think we've, we've, we've realized it's not just about the pretty pictures and how beautiful our destinations are. We now have to give them facts that they can uh, use for their customers so that their customers are safe. Travel agents have to reinvent themselves and know a little bit more about health and insurance than perhaps they felt they knew before, because that's going to be very important. The fact that consumers that didn't use a travel agent um, had a really rough experience with what happened, um, that means that they're, uh, as a travel consultant, is going to have to give a real sense of confidence to any, any travelers that they have asked the right questions and they've got the right answers. We just did a round table with some uh, media journalists to ask them a little bit about, okay, what do you need from a destination to share with your readers and uh, if you're a blogger and, and what it's going to look like to travel in the future for you as a, as a travel journalist. And they were very concerned about um, being in, in close proximity with a lot of people on a fam trip, for example. So that's going to maybe change the way we all do fam trips when we're allowed to in the future. Um, the virtual fam trips, they're enjoying that, but it's hard to get it. And if you're not in the destination, it's sort of not the same. But I think too that what the one thing I got from talking to a lot of journalists like yourself is give us the real facts. We need to know what's open, when it's opened, and uh, and and not just the pretty pictures. We can see with all of what's happening with um, a lot of us as destinations doing webinars, training. The travel agents are desperate for information, which is wonderful right now. They're going online, learning about our destinations. But we need to put on not just the beautiful beaches and the wonderful things to do. It's also how we are going to make sure that we're a safe destination for their customers because they're going to be responsible for that health and well-being of their customers. So I think our relationship's going to change. But I so agree with Dana, like the collaborative spirit of the industry. Um, we're just not competing against each other. We're competing to make sure Canadians travel again soon and safely. 
And it sure puts a whole new meaning or level of meaning to duty of care and what everybody has to bring into the office every day. I, I'm, I'm wondering, I think Dana, you might've just touched on it, but uh, specialist programs, agency specialist programs have big, been big for every kind of supplier in the industry. Is this something that any of you are looking at in terms of adding another element in there, which would be health and safety related to COVID? You know? Yeah, I think it's something we're, we're certainly looking at. We do have our Ireland specialist program and then we, um, where we um, share our, our, our guidelines and approach and we have made those updates in terms of like our, our consumer website, you know, with some of those and then also we're looking at some some upgrades upgrades around there. We also have our dedicated travel agent Facebook page, which I think is a great way to quickly get out some of that information and share those pieces as well. But it will be, you know, I think integral to have that standardized piece and I, the, um, the European Commission has come out with a reopen EU interactive platform which is a great tool for agents to just click on the country they may be interested in and it lists specific guidelines so I think having that one-stop shop for agents is a great opportunity for them to just be up to date with any of the restrictions and see those guidelines so that they can inform their clients and I think to Sue's point we've seen such wonderful engagement from from agents in terms of the numbers and the enthusiasm around learning so just to say thanks so much for, for that it's great to have that collaboration together. Michael? Uh, Bob, as you're aware, we just finished our uh, seminars with you guys last week, and we had a great, great turnout, over 120 agents getting trained. Um, like Dan was just re uh, referring to, um, it's about the facts, you know, uh, and making sure that we present the facts of how Hong Kong is, has come out of COVID and in phase one and what we're prepared to do in phase two. So what we're working right now currently on is a clean book summary, quote unquote clean book, talking about, you know, from touch points of a consumer journey, once that of uh, their clients or themselves after visiting the destination, talking about the airport, talking about the transportation to and from the airport, talking about the hotels, um, the tours, the dining and shopping establishments, and again, and to show the flexibility we have throughout that, that journey. So we're putting all that together right now as our next step. Mm -hmm. well, I'm gonna give you all a shot at me. Is there a question I haven't asked you yet? Call me whatever names you want, but what's, what's the question that I haven't asked that you need to to answer. Come on, guys. Sue, why don't you do that one? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, um, let's see. Uh, you're also amazing at the questions you ask, Bob. Um, I, I think that it's, it's more um, the travel agents to reach out to all of us, whether it's our associations that we're uh, all three of us are involved with Brand USA, of course, in the US with Discover America Canada, the ETC and PADA, um, and there's other associations as well around the world, is sort of just reach out to us and ask us what you need us to tell you. Like maybe we, we're not doing things we should be doing to help you sell more effectively. We're getting such wonderful results, like Dana said, with the virtual, whether it's a chef destination or a Spotify playlist from Visit Florida or shelling on the beach today in Fort Myers in Australia, visit the koala bears. And some of the fun, creative things that have happened in the last few months has been really outstanding. And I applaud all the destinations and their teams that have come up with some really fun and creative ways to inspire travelers and, and travel agents as we're trying to support them as best we can. Um, so I don't know, questions, um, when can we all travel again? I'm desperate to get on an airplane and go somewhere, anywhere. <laughs> Life, I haven't been on a plane in months. So my passport's uh, having a tough time at home right now. So uh, I think all of us in this business are just so passionate we're here to support each other. It's all about the industry and to the travel agents out there. It's such a difficult time, we know, but we know Canadians will come back and we as an industry will support you as much as we can um, and go and have fun and travel again. Like the world is open and ready for us hopefully soon. <laughs> what about you, Dana? Yeah, I think just to, you know, your um, last piece there around one of the things we should is, you know, optimistic or, or pessimistic, and I, and I think really, you know, optimistic is the tone. I think, the, but the minister actually, you know, very similar words. Of what I was thinking in terms of resilience, right? And I think we've seen such great examples over the past while of how resilient the industry is and how um, willing everyone is to come together and work together. And I think to the point, it's not so much. And we often joke about this as the ETC is that you know we are promoting. Europe together, and then from there, it's our individual member countries. But we, you know, we've met more often. Um, even, you know, in the past while just sharing insights and working together. And I think everyone is keen to get 
people back and traveling, right? And and uh, going from there. So I think it's just I've been so impressed over the last while of the resiliency and just the the collaboration um, amongst that. And I think it's just a great opportunity to, to continue that. Yeah. Michael. Yeah, like I just you know very boring without travel. You know, I was saying can't wait to get back on the planes with like all the Canadians out there and having and and have fun, right? So I think it's again. The, the global, you know, recovery. Uh, we work together um, as as a whole industry, and let's 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 go for it. Well, and I guess you know, my I don't know whether I'd like to be a destination because you know you're marketing in a time of the when 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 the only certainty is uncertainty, and I'm just wondering, you know, maybe what's the message you want to get out to everybody, loud and clear? Michael, you want to start? Uh, well, for travel agents, we're, we're here for you. You know, if there's anything we can do to help you sell, we want to make sure we have all those protocols in place. And uh, again, it's, 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 no, no one has a crystal ball, but we need to be all prepared once the gates open to go after the audience. So that's what we're doing right now with, with our, our trade, our airlines and tour operators and, and agent partners, getting ourselves ready when Canadians feel comfortable enough and to go back on the plane and travel you know, either domestically, transporter, or internationally, but be ready to service them. Sue? Um, I, I think the same as everyone else is that um, you know, we will as destinations and the ones that we represent, make sure it's safe before we come out with big advertising campaigns to say, welcome back. Um, we will wait till we're ready to welcome uh, Canadians and visitors back to assure that everyone's safe. And that's, I know, important to um, all of the clients that we work with. They're very uh, careful about looking after the health of their own people. Um, of course, Canada first. And then, of course, our visitors that come to see us are the ones that we send. But the other thing is, is almost like what has happened in the last few months has almost been a little bit of a Mother Nature reset. Think about some of the positive things that have happened around the world as Turtles are nesting again on beaches in Costa Rica they haven't done for five years. Uh, the reefs are coming back. You can see fish in the Venice Canal. I mean, there is something that maybe we all have to learn from this as well going forward is not to go back and do the things that we were doing before to upset the, uh, the planet. So maybe we can also learn from this. I hope we all do um, to be kind and and uh, look after the world maybe a little better than we did in the past. Because I believe the tourists coming up are want to go, but also going to know, want to know what our sustainable tourism practices are going to be in our destinations as well. Not just for them personally, but for the environment. So I think that's an important lesson going forward as well. Dana, yeah. I'll give you the last word and then we'll go to questions, so. Okay, okay, super. Um, so I think just in terms of the messaging, I think it is that, you know, that it's all around the message tone and, and timing. And I think working together once we've built up that consumer confidence. So I think the tour care, as we mentioned, is a great example of organizations coming together to put safety guidelines in place that will help build that consumer confidence. And I think as that builds, then we can look to sharing some of those additional kind of passion points and messaging. And I think, you know, from an Ireland standpoint, like, you know, we're known for those lush green landscapes, those outdoor spaces. Um, the rich culture, but also that warm Irish welcome and, and you know, that, that all of those things, like all of our you know, destinations, those things are still there, right? And we're waiting to welcome people back um, when the time is right. So I think it's just getting the tone and, and, and the timing right, but all of our destinations are so eager to welcome people back, in particular in Ireland with our, with our warm Irish welcome. We can't wait uh, to get people back. So. Okay. Well, let's go to questions. And I think the first one's from Michael Scott Iverson. And I think it's going to be a hot potato for the industry for a while. His question is, a big concern we have heard from our clients is the lack of medical insurance coverage for COVID-19 while in destination. Have any of the panel heard of or are considering offering tourists medical insurance coverage for COVID-19? Sue, <laughs> go for it. We have actually have um, two of our clients um, right now that are seriously looking at this, that there will be the opportunity for international uh, visitors or any visitors to, um, when they come into the destination to have insurance. Um, 
it will uh, very much one of the big concerns is that uh, how the visitors are screened before they actually come into the destination. So if you're in Toronto or Vancouver and we're doing temperature tests and we're doing um, medical surveys before, once they get into destination, um, if they're having to be screened again, then they'll have the ability for um, getting potentially insurance. I know the Jamaica is, has talked about this um, recently as well, and uh, Costa Rica is, and I know that there's some um, uh, discussions, a lot of, a lot of um, destinations, and also with the insurance companies is um, how are they going to manage this? Because it's particularly once for us in the United States, when the snowbirds want to come back um, for the winter, they're going to want to know that they're covered. So that is something that I know the insurance um, companies are working on as well. But there's no answer, but it's coming, I think. Got a question about airports and the, the, whether um, I think maybe Michael or Dana, you could handle this uh, about the amount of time it's taking to get through airports, you know, from arriving to getting on the plane and from landing to getting off the plane. Are you guys up to speed on what the airports are doing in your destinations? Michael? Uh, we don't, I don't have the actual, actual time. I can get back to the, the, the person that's asking the question about approximate time uh, offline, but I'll tackle the airport. Okay. Um, the Hong Kong International Airport is it's one of the leading airports, of course, in the world, winning multiple Skytrax awards. One of them is, you know, it was, it was the very first international airport to introduce the clean technology, the clean tech technology, oh. the robots to clean the airport. They've also introduced disinfecting um, booths for staff at the airport that they're further exploring to looking at passengers. So they're, in, they're looking at the most up-to-date modern technology to make the place even more safe. So they're very proactive in this area. Dana? Yeah, I think similar, I know from the Dublin airport team, it's something that they are looking at very closely. And one of the things they had mentioned too is around the, I think the consistency of process. So looking at, you know, hopefully across the EU that it can be consistent across so that people have that confidence and understanding. I think they're all looking at, you know, whether it's um, looking at one meter versus two meters because the WHO, as we know, has enough one meter. Some countries are looking at two meters, so that really will impact. And I think they're, they're working through the process that as, um, as passenger numbers look to, to build and looking to where that, that expands, right? So I think it's something that they're looking at very closely to make sure that you know, it's done in a, in a safe and cautious way, but you know, as speedy as, as, it, as it can be. So I know it's something they're evaluating. Um, right. um, I do have another insurance co co question from young Mr. Chris Robinson, but he wants to know whether Canadians will travel uh, until uh, the travel insurance issue is 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 resolved. The coverage issue is resolved. Maybe Dana, you want to continue on that one? I, I would suggest, and there's been um, a couple of recently some surveys for, about snowbirds by Snowbird Advisor um, that was in the paper yesterday, and and I think that the uh, the baby boomers and that age group are going to be probably the most concerned about the insurance coverage. Um, I think the millennials might not be as concerned and indications of what we've seen is that they'll be the first travelers back um, and they won't be as concerned about insurance as we think perhaps the, um, the more uh, the baby boomers and that that have had potentially more of a health risk if they travel. So that's um, kind of the indication, but Chris, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Well, but there's a double-edged sword there too, because there's the whole idea of insuring yourself uh, in case you get sick. But the, the other option, the other side of the argument, is the economic one, where if you do get sick, the cost of being hospitalized in destination is horrendous, no matter how ill you are or not. You know, and yeah. I think well, that's a lot of concern for a lot of people. It's interesting that the majority of people that go, the Canadians that go to the United States do not take travel insurance. Mm -hmm. Travel insurance, when you look at where they, they're taking it for more long haul, more international travel, but when they just go for a weekend away or a, a shorter holidays, they're not as inclined um, to book travel insurance or if they're booking themselves and not going through a travel agent. So I think that will change as we move forward into this new norm. Dan, do you have any Facebook Live questions? Uh, we have one additional submission that came into the chat box here. Right. Um, so this is from Ricky. Um, Dana, you had mentioned the tour care guidelines for tour operators. 
Do any of you think there will be guidelines for countries that are trying to get back the confidence of travelers? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think we are starting to see that. I know there are some countries that have been coming out. Um, you know, some countries in Europe are starting to um, establish that and, and the guidelines within that vary, right? But I think you'll see that within many countries to give consumers that confidence, they will have their, whether it's their safety seal or their otherwise, but it essentially refers to the list of guidelines that they're putting in place to ensure travelers are safe. But I think the key thing around that is the, the monitoring and review of that to make sure that that does um, sustain. So yes, I know there's certain countries that have come up with that and I think you'll probably start to see more um, as we progress, yeah. So I got a, a question for you about whether Hawaii and Alaska could open for tourism from Canada sooner than mainland USA. Is that an option? Well, it's already, there are flights going in from mainland into Hawaii now, um, but anyone that is not a resident has to quarantine for two weeks, for 14 days. Um, we've had very um, serious conversations with um, the two major airlines from Canada, WestJet and Air Canada, um, about flying into Hawaii. Hawaii is very concerned, again, about the protocols of how we would manage um, the travelers from Canada into Hawaii. Um, so those conversations have been taking place and the dates of when we would potentially bring the routes back as well. So um, we're hoping, um, we're hoping by um, fourth quarter 2020 that there will be back um, to capacity out of Canada. But mainland, there are already flights in to Hawaii. That just means the visitors have to quarantine, um, which they're not all doing. <laughs> Final words, anyone? And then we will say thank you for your participation and move on to our case study, which is next. Dana, final words? Yeah, was it just um, thanks for having us and thanks for this opportunity to, to share and, and collaborate. And a big thank you to the agents and our, and our partners during this um, really difficult time and uh, for, for coming together. And that's a creative collaboration, as we mentioned. So yeah, thanks to everyone. Michael? Yeah, thanks to the audience for listening to us. and. Uh, Look forward to seeing everyone, hopefully uh, in person, no, not too far in the near future. And so? No, again, just like everyone else, it's, um, I think we're all missing, we're a very social industry and this is the toughest part is being home and doing this virtually instead of being together and then to share a glass of wine or a nice Irish beer afterwards. So I think we're all um, looking forward to the day we could be together socially distanced in person instead of on Zoom. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you all. Much appreciated. We'll have to do this again in real life. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Thanks. Over to you, Dan. Thank you so much, Dana, Susan, and Michael. And thank you, Bob. That was excellent. We'll take a minute now to prepare for segment three, our case study on Israel, the land of creation, with Gal Hanna, Director of Canada for the Israel Ministry of Tourism. Great. Hello, Gal. Welcome. And Bob, I'll hand you over. And Gal, whenever you're ready, you can hit that share screen button and I'll let you know when we can see it. The, the share screen is not working for some reason. Um, uh, I think I know why it's done that. Just one second. Uh, it wants me to make you a co-host. Okay. Thanks, Gal. It should work now. Excellent. Looks great. Excellent. So um, just to start, Bob, or, or some few uh, few words in advance? <laughs> so so I, I just start. So thank you. So thank you very much for the, the opportunity. Actually, it was very interesting so far to hear about from both Jamaica and from Susan and, and the other friends. Um, and, and I tried to think about how to address the, the topic properly and I think that really the, the most iconic pictures that I could think of, it's the Western Wall in Jerusalem, when it used to be packed with, with people coming to prayer, um, Jewish people coming to prayer. And, and nowadays it's, it's not empty completely because we did start um, to um, kick off the domestic travel and, and to reduce some of the limitations, but, but it's basically uh, empty. And, and I remember when, 
when the former conversation took place now, I remember about a um, Chinese prime minister back in the 70s when he was asked by Henry Kissinger, he, he asked him about what is the perception about the, the French Revolution, uh, what do you think of it? And, and the Chinese prime minister, it's, uh, his name was Zhu Enlai, he said, it's too soon to tell. It's a 200 years after, but he was, he, he was still cautious. And I think that uh, basically what we need, we need a bit of patience. I think that uh, uh, a lot is going to change in the, in the next few uh, weeks, months uh, from now. And we don't need to rush into things because we already see some positive trends and I'm going to address that soon. Now, when it comes to Israel, it, it hit us basically in the worst time ever. We got 4.6 million tourists who came to Israel in 2019. January 2020 actually was the best January in history for Israel. Um, and, and, and now, and then in March, we just closed the borders. We were probably one of the first destinations to take this drastic decision um, that eventually was, was justified. We know that uh, although it was criticized in the, in the beginning uh, by many, and that thought that we are exaggerating. Today, uh, people understand that this is the reason why Israel took the, the pandemic uh, well. Um, and you need to understand that when it comes to Israel closing the borders, although we have one main international uh, airport, we are an island economy. So when our borders are closed, it means that we are literally, no one can come into Israel and we are located um, in the in the Middle East, just after between mm -hmm. Lebanon, um, Egypt, and Jordan, uh, and the majority of our activities in the last, I would say, three years were, was to um, to incentivize airline companies to open direct routes to Israel because we understood that that this is the I would say the X factor, the game changer when it comes to tourists, and we got over 70 new direct routes. Um, annually in the last three years and uh, for more destinations and, and for more companies. And um, just before the pandemic outbreak, we got new flights from, uh, from the UK with Virgin. We got uh, uh, the, the next, the flight scheduled by El Al was supposed to launch a new flight from, uh, from Chicago and, and, the, and the future was optimistic. And, and then again, the, the pandemic outbreak. And just to elaborate about what Israel has been done since the pandemic outbreak in March, um, we basically did a trial and error. And I think that these days when the pandemic is still out there and we see some second waves in, in a lot of other countries, I think that this strategy allows you to take a look at the decision-making process in Israel. Uh, and in, the, in all of the discussions that I have been in the last, I would say at least a month, everyone are talking about the safety and the uncertainty. And when it translates to the tourists, I think that the safety and the uncertainty, we need to give the tourists, the future tourists, the, the feeling that they are safe, just like Susan just said. Uh, and in Israel, this is what we did. We understood that we can't block um, the economy for that long. We took some extreme measures. So for over, for about three weeks, we closed everyone at home and they were able to go shopping and to do some walking up to 50 meters from their home and it was extreme but it was needed uh, and and the fact that we did that allowed us to kick off um, many of the economy just about a month ago i would elaborate i will elaborate in a few minutes and um, why it what it is so significant now and um, but we did a strategy of trial and error we anticipated that when we will reduce some of the limitations, it will get a second outbreak or some, some other outbreaks, but it's manageable. And I think that this is the right word to describe how Israel is addressing, addressing the, the pandemic, that it's manageable. And this is why so many surveys um, nominate Israel as one of the best countries that dealt with, dealt and dealing with the COVID-19. Um, and, and I'm very pleased to say that, and I'm very proud because I think that Israel is the startup nation uh, and the Holy Land, that this mixture is going to serve us very well, uh, hopefully in the near future. So we did a trial and error strategy. We, we closed everything, and then we gradually started to reopen the economy. We can continue to the closing of the economy, but, but it's a depth is issue. 
and someone and sometime will need to pay this debt. And we understood that we can't do that for so long because again, we don't want our children and future generation to pay, if not needed, um, the extra money of, of the interest of the national debt. Uh, and in Israel, you need to understand that the, 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 the tourism is a major economic engine growth. It's specifically in the periphery. It occupies 250,000 people. It's, it's, an, it's an industry worth 25 billion uh, shekel. It's, it's, it's very, very important. And, and what we did, we, we, we allocated the measures to red, yellow, and green. We opened the domestic travel. And by that, I mean that 30% of our hotels are already open. And we see in some of them 90 and 95% occupancy rates. And all of them implemented what we call the purple standard. It's, it's a health and measure standards to make sure the safety of any tourist that will come, not only to the hotel, but to the attractions, to our national parks. And, and just like it was said before, there are some positive ramifications of the COVID. Um, we, our national parks are now are available to book the places in advance um, in the, in online. Uh, you, can, you can book a place in the camping sites. It's very organized, it's very sterile. Um, our beaches are clean. It was, I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, most of them are accessible. Um, most of the beaches are already open. Um, it's, and it's perfectly safe. You can, you can go in to see the, the, cities, the city markets uh, in Jerusalem, in Apple, uh, in any other, in, in all of our biggest cities are open and people can buy everything. They keeping the social distancing, they keeping their masks on and the, all the safety measures are being uh, taken care of by, by the local, from the police to the, uh, to the different municipalities. And we understand that if we did open the, the economy, we need to make sure that it's going to be safe and sound for everyone because we can't allow ourselves uh, a big outbreak. And just like we addressed the issue to begin with, we are going to do that um, one more time. And, and it's not only, as I said, the, the best thing about Israel experience in the last month is that we saw an involvement about um, how tourism is dealing with the, the pandemic. So when I'm saying managing the crisis, this is exactly what I mean. I mean that the hotels to start with, and I, I guess that most of you know the famous reputation that we have for the Israeli breakfast. Now the Israeli breakfast is, is huge. It's, it has all the pastries, tons of ver versions of eggs and, and pies and, and, and whatever. Basically, once you are eating an Israeli breakfast, you don't need to eat anything else during the day. And, 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 and I was thought, asked a lot about what's, what's the future of the Israeli breakfast. So yes, in the beginning, the hotels just closed the buffet. They said, listen, it's, it's unsafe. We can deal with the, the purple standard requires you to take some measures uh, in, in, in sanitary um, aspects. And they said, it's, it's too much. And today I, I must share with you pictures that I got yesterday from Carlton Hotel in Tel Aviv. And, 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 and what they did basically, they, they renewed um, how they, they, they serve the buffet and they split it to portions. And now it's all um, being uh, sanitized. It's, it's all in, in, in single uh, dishes. So it's safe, you can go and eat. And this is the involvement of when I'm saying you don't need to deal with the crisis, you need to manage that. And in Israel, we know how to, unfortunately, we have experience in managing crises. We know how to do that. All the holy sites have reopened, implementing some, some new measures to make sure that the, um, we are cleaning everything on a more regular basis. Um, we, can, we make sure that there are only certain amount of people in every place. The hotels are doing the same. The beaches are doing the same. And, and I think that if you are going to see whether it's Elat, our sun escape city, whether if it's Jerusalem or Tel Aviv, you can see people strolling in the streets, enjoying the, their time and doing that, complete, feeling completely safe. And, and, and I guess that this is how, we'll, at least for now, the new world, when people can go, should go uh, travel, but they need to make sure, they need to understand that it's going to look a bit different than what they used to. 
Um, and, when, and basically when, when it comes to Israel, you, you can see the new normal. The new normal is already, I would say, um, our, our life. We, we, we are doing that for over a month now. And, and we see that it's, it's going along uh, perfectly fine. And, and, and I think that this is what uh, people will ask. People will ask uh, for, for safety destinations, destinations that they can feel safe. Um, and, and this is when, where the agents and I will, will make the difference. And I remember, I, I just read a book lately in which they, they talked about the automation and the digitization of, of, of industries. And they said that in, in the next 100 years, we will see a, a machine with a dog and a man standing in front. The dog will make sure that the man won't touch anything because all automated, it, must, it, it will probably ruin something. And the man role will be to feed the dog. So, so now I'm happy that the, the role of an agent is, is more um, serious than what it used to be before. We thought that something can be changed by machines, and now we know that the, the touch of an agent, the, the thoughts, the suggestions, is going to be much more important than what they used to be. Um, and when it comes to Israel, where is the best place to go other than Israel when you can have um, the sites like the Capernaum, the Holy Sepulchre, the holy sites alongside some beach destinations, the, the, the non-stop city of Tel Aviv, places that you can go for a long haul and get the full package. And, and as a personal note, and I think that this is a, my most important note for, that I'm going to say now, is, is Bertolt Bert once said that small changes are the enemy of, of paradigm shifts. That in order to do big changes, you need to, to make a big impact. And, and now it's our time to think about responsible tourism, to think about how we utilize this time that we had, this time that we have to rethink about all the, I would say the bad implications of tourism when it comes to over tourism. We just recently, you know, we have short memory, but just before the pandemic outbreak, we saw voices from so many cities crying out of, on over tourism and we saw we know that accessible tourism is, is a big issue and we sh it should be a bigger issue. And I'm happy to say that Israel, one of the first press releases that we did after the, the uh, opening the, the domestic travel was by, by one of our municipalities, the Tel Aviv municipality, saying that we made all Tel Aviv beaches accessible. And it's not only for accessible, we have so many opportunities to make our journey to anywhere more significant with volunteering, with doing some eco, um, eco tourism, and, and you know, and even if when it comes to Israel, everyone knows Jerusalem, everyone knows Tel Aviv. Ramle is one of the off the beaten path the cities that we have. Um, one one place that you can see there is is the is is a church where Napoleon slept when he came to Israel. Um, you see, you can see that lovely market of Ramle where you can eat so many diverse culinary um, opportunities from, from authentic Arabic uh, hummus all the way to, to authentic and, and more, I would say, elaborated, uh, elevated um, Israeli, Israeli food. The Alch Pool is a place where, um, where, um, where the mom of, of, of Constantinus, the, the Roman emperor, she built it in order for people when they are coming from the Mediterranean, they are going to, tell, to Jerusalem um, as in a pilgrimage to make sure that they will have a place to bath. Uh, and, and again, over tourism is something that we need to address now. Places won't have the, the, the occupancy rates that they used to have. People won't be able to attend those major cities like they used to, and we need to, Readdress those topics because we have the opportunity to do so. Um, and just to conclude, both Masada and Herodion were places where Jews thought it's going to be the end of the world. It was in the first Roman uh, Roman Jewish War, um, the last. It was the last sanctuary of, of the Jews when the Roman came. Uh, in, in, it's both very famous stories, and both of them, the Jews thought it's going to be the end of the world. And I'm 
I'm here in Canada to promote tourism back to Israel after 2,000 years uh, from this uh, revelation by, um, by, the, by the Jews and the Romans. And, and, and I think that we will, we will overcome this pandemic. We need to make sure that we are going to do that uh, better than, than what we used to do before. I think that we have in Canada in specific, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to say that, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that in Canada, the industry is, like they said, they, they're resilient. The industry is, has the sense of, 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 of respect and, and understanding of how important tourism is. And I think that in collaboration between the destinations, the industry, uh, we can serve a great value to the tourists and more important, a great value to the world. And that's in a, in a short bit. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Gal. That was great. We'll take a few minutes now to take some questions from the audience. So the first one is there have been so many negative impacts of COVID-19 to travel and tourism, but have you seen any positive impacts, perhaps environmental or other? So, so I think just like Sue said, we see turtles are nesting again on beaches. Um, in Thailand, we, we saw a huge um, <coughs> in infrastructure um, um, investment to re recover the beaches. In Israel, I can say that projects that took us so long to, to, to do, um, we were able to do that in, in much less time um, because people were, were home. So we made, um, we made the beaches accessible. We made the old city of Jerusalem accessible. A lot of, of projects, we understood the, we understood the time and, and the importance. And, and, this is, and we, we focus on that. And, and right now, we have some major projects when it comes to sustainability. We have major projects in order to get more people involved in reconstructing the, the nature and, and the nature parks. And you can volunteer in some of the parks. You can, uh, you can go and you can experience a lot of things that usually people thought, didn't think of. And now they are looking for volunteering opportunities. They are looking to do something for, for the world because they understood that everything, is, everything can, be, can go away and we need to take it in consideration when we think. So we, trips won't only be a leisure, it should have a sense of message. And this is what I hope that we will all as an industry will embrace and, and will prioritize because I think that when a tourist will call, as opposed to three or four months ago, when a tourist will call to an agent in the next month, hopefully when the borders will be reopened, he will ask him, where should I go? And he won't only ask him, listen, I want to book Israel, he, because he understands that he doesn't have the full picture. And, and this is where our role as an agent, as an industry, is to promote and to ask from destinations, ask from hotels, ask from uh, the different attractions, listen, make your either destination hotel or, 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 or an attraction, make it accessible. Make sure in Israel, we were one of the first countries in the world to regulate that every new hotel that is being built must have accessible rooms. And I think it's an important message that we all should embrace and we should, and we should transfer the message to all over that it's not, it shouldn't be regulated, it should be the norm. That's great, thank you, Gal. And an anonymous attendee asks, um, you did touch upon this earlier, but um... Uh, they ask, how will the tourist experience change in Israel post COVID-19? I believe that the tourism in Israel, we, we have some, I would say, positive uh, starting point. Uh, because in Israel, most of our mo popular sites are outdoor. So in that regard, it's, it's pretty easy um, to maintain the, the demand. I think that all we, it, and it's connected to the last question, about the positive um, outcomes, I think that many sites that weren't available to, to book online now understand and they implemented some technologies so they so people can book online and it will reduce the time that you stood in line before or something like that. Um, so most of our activities anyway are outdoors, so it's relatively easy. And the ones that are not, we manage the demand. We understand 
we understand that this is the this is the future of tourism managing the demand of a destination and managing the demand um, from it, and it comes from all the supply chain from the from the flight to the to the bus to the and, and to the to the different sites and to the different attractions and and again we are the startup nation we already implemented um, so many so much technologies in the last three months in, in the different hotels and um, we have a lot of virtual tours so people can book when they booking they have a clearer view on what they are booking and um, if it's a national park so they can go on a virtual tour to the national park to see what they they are going to book now um, and 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 the future of travel in israel will be i think 70 percent similar to what it was before and um, and and it's and it's different when it comes to to other i think that this is and one of our strengths is opposed to other destinations that we will keep things pretty much the same because to start with we were kind of different and that transitions nicely into the uh, very last question that was submitted here and that was does the israel ministry of tourism have a plan to engage canadian travel agents when the time is right absolutely we i came here what almost a year ago and in order to do exactly that um, we are working constantly and all the time. I'm, you know, I think that, uh, and I must say that uh, Bob, Wendy, and David, uh, and Baxter team are probably the ones that I know. I know the best, and I'm proud to say that. Uh, but on top of that, we are working constantly with the industry, and we understand that we need to to support and to, I guess, to collaborate with as many as we can. We already, in the pipeline, we already have some, some activities and I will be more than happy to everyone to address us, to offer us um, ideas, thoughts, and comments, and, and we will be more than happy to do so. That's inspiring. Thank you so much, Gal. Thank you. Okay, that wraps up day one of Travel Webcast Week. I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for day two, where the theme will be Hotel How To, shifting marketing efforts to attract local clientele, promote safe protocols, and engage with agents. Thanks so much to our moderator, Bob Mowat, and a huge thank you goes out to our panelists and everyone else that participated today. Take care, everyone. We'll talk to you soon.